Hello and welcome to the show. My guest today is an American freelance writer, a film producer, and we'll show some of her film work later. She's also an environmentalist who has worked for the likes of UNICEF, Fair Trade International, and other good causes around the world. Catherine M. Wernz has been living and working in Germany for five years now. And uh, welcome to the show. I must ask you straight away, I said Catherine M. Wernz, but I know uh, the name should actually be Wernz. Yes. And you, would you prefer that? Yeah, I would. <laughs> I would like to slowly become a real German. Really? Yeah. Oh, rather than an American, are you not happy to be an American? I am ready to trade in my passport. Really? Yeah. Are you gonna, oh, this is a, I didn't know this. <laughs> <laughs> we could spend the rest of the show talking about this. Why, you know? <laughs> Why? Why? Lots of just, I, I could give lots of reasons why I love Germany, but I can just say I feel great here in every way. Mm. And I don't feel like I fit in in the US. Yeah, well, this we'll, we'll go straight away to a picture you sent us of your your grandfather, because you do have German heritage. Mm -hmm. No, not This is actually great-grandfather? Uh, my grandmother is in that photo, and then Where her she? Parents. Where is she? She's my in the flowery is dress. Here. Yeah, in the flowery dress. And then next to her are her parents, so my great-grandparents. And this was taken in New Jersey, but my great-grandparents are... They came over from Germany in 1903. They went to New York. And he was a writer, I believe. He was writing uh, in Germany and in the US about Germany. He was a journalist, so mm. writing about all sorts of topics in both places. And had trouble in both places. Had trouble in both places. Yeah? Because yeah. it was a bit suspicious. What that was this, suspicious? That this German man would come to Brooklyn in 1903 and then continue to travel back and forth to Germany. But what was suspicious in 1903? There was nothing. Pr not no, a not then, with but it. I guess his movements between the two countries. Uh -huh. And the fact that he was a journalist and some other things he might have gotten involved in. So there was questions in Brooklyn and there was questions in Berlin about what exactly he was doing. And did he talk to you about Germany? I never met him. Oh! <laughs> I never met him. Oh, right. Oh, <laughs> never mind. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, I, I want to show... I'm looking for the other picture now. Ah, yes. Now, this, this brings us... Oh! Technology. I hate it. <laughs> this brings us uh -huh. to this picture. Yes. And I thought, hello, why did you send me the pictures <laughs> of fish and chip shop? called Classics, but there is a significance. There's a significance. So Classic is my Berlin family's name. It's yeah. my great-grandparents yeah. for the Classics. And at some point, we're not sure, because a few of us are working on the family history. So I have found my German relatives that still live in Germany yeah. because communication was cut off and they also do research. And at some point, Classic probably belonged to our family and then it was bought over. And where's the fish and chip shop? That one is in Friedrichstrasse. No. Is it in Berlin? Yeah, it's in Berlin. Oh, right, a fish and yeah. chip shop in Berlin that I didn't know about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and is all this, this background from your family, is that what drew you to this country? I think genetically, on some level, probably, but I was raised American. I mean, of course, there was maybe a few German old records around the house or things from Germany around the house, but I didn't even know that they were where they were from or who we were. It wasn't really talked about. So I slowly built up my own love and sort of fever for Germany. And my family just thinks this is weird and funny. To this day? Yeah, to this day, yeah. I mean, my mother has been here to visit quite often, but the rest of my family is quite American. Yeah, yeah. You, we'll talk more about your childhood mm -hmm. and how you came to be here, but you, you also have a love for another country, Africa. Mm -hmm. And actually, I know that you lived there part of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll come to that too, but how did that happen? How did this association with Africa happen? I followed a boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, no, this is great, because normally <laughs> my guests sit here and say, what, what are you doing in Germany? I followed a guy or I followed a girl, you know. Right. Uh, but th in this case, you followed a boy to Africa. Yeah, okay. and... I actually like to make the differentiation that when I came to Germany, it was for no one. It was for no boy, it was for no job. So when I went to Africa, it was to visit my boyfriend, who's Italian. We're still good friends. He had a job there and he said, come visit. So I bought a plane ticket for one month 
and I just never went back to the States, basically. Mm. So a year and a half later, I flew back to New York, got my stuff. My mother had packed up my apartment for me and then went back to Senegal and lived there for a few years. And then since 2006, I've been living there part time. Mm. And the Sahel region mm -hmm. is what interests you. The Sahel region I looked up goes right across the sort of north of Africa. Many, but you're on one particular region in Mali, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I live in Senegal, mm. but then Mali is neighbors. Yeah. And they both are in the Sahel. Yeah. And you've made a film from nothing. How did that happen? How did that happen? Um, I guess we can, we can say almost from nothing in terms of money. Yeah. No, but that's from right. unbelievable generosity from people in terms of time and work and donated footage and photos and contacts. So there was a whole team of people that I built around me, volunteers. And the film crew were also basically volunteers. Working and what's the film about? The film is about what's going on in Mali through the lives and voices of musicians. So I had started this project when Mali was not yet a dinner table word, when no one knew where it was, before it hit the news, because there was an insurgence of terrorists and also other internal problems going on in Mali adding to it. So I thought musicians are really important in Mali and their voices need to be heard somehow within Mali and outside of Mali in order for people to pay attention to what's going on. Yeah, well, what is going on? What is going on now? Yeah. What is, I mean, what was going on then was there were some terrorists who came down through Libya. There was internal rebel clashes with a group called the Tuaregs, which also were actually nomadic people mostly and they live between countries. And there's a long-standing argument going on in the north of Mali that since France basically drew these arbitrary country lines and divided up ethnic groups and land, that didn't make sense. So people argued that's been going on for 60 years. What's happening now is France went in last year, started an intervention, a war, to get the extreme terrorists out. So that's still going on. You don't hear about it, but there are soldiers every day there ferreting out the terrorists. But then there's, it's a very complex situation. There's all sorts mm. of different groups with different interests. OK, um, let's see a few clips from the film, which hopefully will give you a taster of what it's all about. On était à Tombouctou. On vivait paisiblement avec tout le monde. Et les premiers uh, avril, Tombouctou a été attaqué. The Mongols have announced that they are in control of the northern stronghold of Kijahadi. The Egyptian militants who control the territory for 10 months melted away into the This population has lost a lot of liberty. Every day, morning and evening, we see things that are insensate in them. We torture people who are on ampute, people who are on frappe. À cause de, de la cigarette ou autre chose. Violé. On a vu beaucoup de gens qu'on a eu à violer. Today, the Malian government has requested the assistance of the French army to help oust armed rebel groups in northern Mali. The French led forces in the country. Emergency aid workers have found their supply lines blocked by the fighting. French troops will arrive in the capital Bamako within three days. We are a country of diversity many different ethnic groups. Because we are a like country, we live together. We have Muslim, we have a Catholic, uh, Buddhist, whatever you want. Everybody is free to do what you want. So many different cultures and many different musics. In Mali, there is uh, a big line of brotherhood. 
If you help somebody you don't know, you help yourself. Every day people are working hard in Mali to make things change, to take care of each other and try to bring hope. And we've actually got some film of you in Senegal coming up later in the programme. If you'd like to see the whole film, just go to the website on your screens right now, which is sahelcalling.com. I can recommend it. It's a really nice film. And also on that website, if you'd like to help out with this cause, get in, you can get in contact with Catherine through the website. Um, the film is full of wonderful music. They're, the, the whole country seems to be musicians. Um, although you focus on musicians, it's about much more than musicians, isn't it? There? You know? yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it's about, first of all, just freedom, lots of different types of freedom, but it has also a lot to do with all of the different ethnic groups in Mali who are usually living very peacefully together. And some of that is because of music or through music. And so it's also a bigger message about the use of music in living harmoniously together and also even the role of music and democracy. So that's touched upon, and that will come later in our next film, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, what is the sort of... Who are the Islamist terrorists there? I mean, Mali, and you show that in the film, was a very peaceful uh, country up until, I don't know, was it 10 years ago? And it's all sort of got into turmoil in the last years. I mean, what, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. I mean, good question. I think it caught a lot of people by surprise. So there has been this internal struggle going on for almost yeah. 60 years, this arguing over a small piece of land, not that small, in northern Mali. But these terrorists, these Islamists that came, that were mostly linked to Al-Qaeda, who had weapons and training, thanks to the US and other countries who had been training people against Gaddafi. So after Gaddafi was brought down, the theory is that then these fighters came down through the desert, through Libya, into the north of Mali. And that whole area has been sort of the wild, wild west of West Africa for a long time. So there's always been drug trade going on through there and just anything you could imagine. So what happened is the internal conflict, the group of Tuaregs, not all of them agree as well, but some of the Tuaregs took over this piece of land and said it's ours because Mali had just had a coup. And then the Islamists showed up a week later and said, yeah, thanks, it's ours now. And so began... And they're all fighting images. Yeah. Have you had any... I mean, where, when you were making the film, mm -hmm. did you have any problems yourself? We didn't have any problems in the sense of we stayed where it was safe. We didn't go up to the north. Uh, but it was definitely a very risky, very scary situation, for sure. Um, very tense. At that time, music was completely banned by the government. Um, any type of big get-together. Music was music. completely banned? Be only from the... Um, because they had a state of emergency for the whole country. And that meant no gatherings, no loud music. Uh -huh. So, I mean, music is people's lives. Yeah. So you're now talking about no more weddings, no more parties, no more deaths. Like, uh, there's no life. Yeah. So we attended a few of these secret weddings and concerts and a divorce ceremony. But it was really scarily silent. Mm. Now, I mentioned you, you made the film on a shoestring. Mm -hmm. I do believe you had a little bit of help from UNHCR and Oxfam. No, 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 no. money. No money from No them. money, but help. But you did have an anonymous donor. What we happened? We did? What happened? What happened is I got a phone call a few weeks before we were going to go. We had raised about 8,000 euros, basically through friends and networks, through a crowdsourcing, crowdfunding. And a few weeks before myself and the director and the cameraman were going to fly, I got this call from the assistant of a very famous person, who I will just call Wonder Cat. That's the code name. And he said, listen, he talked to me for two hours about environmental destruction in Africa. And this was very interesting to me. And then at the end, he said, well, I'm really calling because I want to give you money for your film. 
I said, okay. He said, I, he said, I know you have no idea what you're doing and you need a lot more money than what you have. So I'm giving you 18,000 euros. Hire a good sound guy, get good sound equipment. Good luck. Wow. And he yeah. remains anonymous. He remains anonymous. I've gotten to go see him twice and mm. talk to him. You mentioned there um, crowdfunding. I mean, it, I know you're not going to tell me who yeah. he is, so I'm moving on. <laughs> you mentioned crowdfunding. What's, what's it like raising money in this country, in Germany? I wonder, uh, for, mm. for, for, for things like that. I mean, there's a very different culture um, about charity in, in, in Germany. Most of it tends mm. to be looked after by the state, whereas in your original country and mine too, there's a lot of uh, charity fundraising because things aren't looked after. I mean... Mm. It was difficult. Yeah. I, I mean, I looked into all sorts of official funding and I had to be German, and I'm not officially. And I tried every major news source in Germany I could think of. I said, listen, I'll, let's make a deal. You know, I've got all the contacts. I've got this whole project around me. I have a film crew. How about you just fund me? And I go make uh, some sort of documentary for mm. you. And I learned quickly that with not being German and having no contacts on the inside of this whole media world, Nothing was happening. There was no chance. Mm. But what about your normal German person? Have you been getting contributions there at all? We have contributions from Germans, for sure, but those are all people that are maybe a well-off uncle of a friend of mine or something, or a volunteer who became a friend of mine. Mm. But I definitely would say that Germans are not overrepresented in any case in our donor mm. pool. So we have about 200 people at this point, more than 200, who have given maybe 10 euros, 30 euros, 100 euros. Okay. Um, let's go back to the beginning, go back to okay. America. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a picture you sent. You sent it to me. Because <laughs> this, this um, I mean, first of all, no, I, before mm. I show the picture, you're from Hackensack, New Jersey. Born in Hackensack, New Jersey. That is very close to a much larger city, but you you're definitely not from that city, is that? No, you can't say that because a person that's really from that city would be really upset We're with We're talking, me. of course, about New York. <laughs> Hackensack, doesn't that overlook Manhattan? Yeah, it's basically, well, it's basically almost across the river. Isn't that? No, no, no. you no. can't say that. Okay, if you weren't okay. born in the five boroughs of New York City, you cannot say you were from New York. And I thought a very famous singer was born there, but I'm wrong. Uh, yeah. He was born in Hobok Ho Hoboken. Hoboken. <laughs> Frank Sinatra. But yeah. I thought it was Hackensack. No, now, <laughs> to the picture. This, this is a very different picture of my guest, Catherine M. Vance. There? Yeah, I sort of love it. I mean, you know, I sent it. So this is me up front with a, it's a marching style of a trombone. So there's no slide, but it's a trombone in 1970s polyester high school marching band uniform. It's definitely polyester, isn't it? Yeah, yeah and yeah, this okay. to me is like quintessential New Jersey, quintessential US. Yeah. That's the embarrassing photo. <laughs> we'll show, show another photo. Okay. Um, that ah. is a completely different story, actually. Mm. More, I wonder, mm. that's obviously Al Gore mm -hmm. in the middle there. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your, how did you meet sure, him? Sure, this was a chance I had. I was working for the Girl Scouts of America, but actually for their Africa and Europe programs. And I was, along with my colleague there, we were sort of the environmental rebel rousers in the organization. So we were selected to, by Al Gore, he trained 1,000 people in the US. Yeah. His first training corps of climate change specialists. So people from all different types of backgrounds, we came together in a training. It was yeah, I mean, I almost want to say it was, it was pretty life-changing, if anything, just to meet yeah. people from all the different backgrounds. Is that what sort of turned you to environmentalism, or were you already... Oh, I was already there? long gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But it was quite a chance to I'm, I'm intrigued how be part of that. that all came along, really, being we saw the picture of you in the marching band. I mean, how did you get into all things green and... You know, I've always, it's one of these things that on one hand, I've always been this way. Since I was a kid, I was complaining about the packaging on the Oreo cookies. I was spending a lot of time outside. Everybody thought I would go to university and become a biologist, and it just didn't happen. I took another path, but I've always kept the environment and animal rights pretty, pretty dear to me. Mm. And you came to Germany, first of all, in 2008, just on a whim, or? 
That was my find your roots. So I've been here on vacation a few times before, but just American style, one week, seven cities type of thing. Yeah, we know that. One. <laughs> yes. yeah. And I came here in 2008. I'd had a bad breakup and was therefore sort of homeless and heartless, directionless overnight. And a good friend, we have some family friends here. That's another story. And this family friend said, "Come live in my house." chill out for a few months because I had a few months until my PhD started back in the States. So I came to Berlin on a homeless, desperate whim. And I you went back to the States went, to complete your mm -hmm, PhD? Went back to the States to start the PhD. Yeah. And, and what happened? Berlin had bit me. You know, it had yeah. just bit me. I would meet someone from Germany at university and just feel like I needed to be back here somehow. And so I did my PhD for one year and then just quit it, left it left my whole New York life, took my two cats. Really? Uh, yeah. You bought them here? Yeah. Yeah. One-way ticket? One-way ticket. I also had to buy a round-trip ticket for a good friend of mine because, you know, you can only bring one cat per person in the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> so a friend of mine got a free trip okay. to Berlin. <laughs> okay. okay. But, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yep. Okay, our reporter, Kirsten Brandes, spent the other day filming with Catherine <laughs> and they began their day in her local park. <laughs> Catherine M. Wernst loves Berlin. One of her favorite places is in the heart of the city, a popular park with a dark history. And our park is this public park that was once known as the Death Strip between the inner and outer walls of the Berlin Wall. And now it's this green park full of life and full of just all types of people. And so it's just a great place to remember. But it's really the swings which are the main attraction for Catherine here. This is the place I come sometimes almost every day, even just for five minutes or ten minutes. And I come up on these swings because it's just such open space. I can work things out, appreciate life. And it just feels good to hang upside down. It makes my body feel good. And there's always something going on here. Berlin is full of cheap places to eat, and Catherine's favorite is in Berlin's nearby Mitte district. Word has got around about this small snack bar, so there are often long queues. And avocado and chili. And chili. And apple We're at in this or in this bay, it's my favorite and I would say the best place to eat in Berlin. It's wraps, pizzas, salads, but it's all done with a little bit of a twist. It's got some Sri Lankan spices in it and it's mostly vegetarian. They serve some sort of fish with something um, and they'll make anything vegan. Right in Berlin. Wow. Oh. Peep, 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 guten appetit. Catherine's love of good food even prompted her to found a cooperative that goes by the name of Dickus B. An international group of people have come together to get their hands on healthy regional products. I started this co-op because I was getting frustrated that I didn't have enough money to buy good food. So I knew that Berlin was surrounded by farms, that there's farms in Berlin. You work a few hours a month, and for this in exchange, you can shop at the co-op, and the prices are cheaper. We offer all of these fresh vegetables and fruits that are pretty local, some of them are regional. Um, we also offer some animal products, so we have eggs from a farm about 200 kilometers away. We have some goat cheese seasonally. Catherine is always on the go, but she needs to let her hair down sometime. African dance is the answer. To her, it feels a bit like flying. Here, she can revel in the familiar rhythms and dream of her next trip to Senegal.
You have endless energy. <laughs> Where'd you get it from? They said, he said that, didn't he? he said, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I take after my mom. She also has endless energy. Yeah. Tell us a, yep. a bit more about Dick is Big, because I mm -hmm. understood what was said there. It's a, it's a food cooperative. Mm -hmm. But how do you organise all the farmers to bring their stuff? I mean, yeah, so there were the old days when we were running around all the different markets with a suitcase on wheels collecting the food. And then there are the new days. There's an, now a group of farmers started their own small business mm -hmm. in order to organize all the farmers around Brandenburg or MacPom. So we get our these, Sorry, I should just say these are the uh, states just the states around, around Berlin. Berlin. Yeah, yeah. And so now things are much more organized for all of our, most of our fruits and vegetables that are from here. So the small business organizes the farmers for us and we get a delivery then from all the different farms on one day. And there are members of this cooperative mm -hmm. and can get the food cheaper. Yeah, yeah, so the idea is, and this is something really well known in the US, that it's actually something Germany is really far behind on. So the concept is everybody works three hours a month, sometimes more, sometimes less, and then we don't need to pay anybody to work, at least not yet. And for that, we get a cheaper price because we're buying directly from the farmers. And so even this middle business, we're losing almost nothing on that. Mm -hmm. And it's much cheaper than if you were to go in the market and buy the same exact tomato from the same there's, farmer. There's a lot of it about, isn't there? I mean, obviously yeah. you say there's a lot more in America, but it's, 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 it's happening over here. Yeah. I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we haven't talked about your writing. Hmm. You write for a number of things, but you've just written an article for the Guardian newspaper in England, which I read the other day. And I, I just have to ask you about that because <laughs> it was about the fact, if I can make it short, that the, there was a fatwa on illegal trafficking of wildlife in Indonesia, and mm -hmm. it's been much more successful than normal conservation campaigns. But, you know, this is giving people fear, isn't it? I mean, a fatwa, is this a good idea? I mean, what, what, you wrote about it. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure yet. I mean, that's why I wrote about it. You're not sure? No, I mean, it's something that I struggle with is, you know, the role of religion and is it good, is it bad? And living between Germany and Senegal and having the U.S. background, those, those three countries treat organized religion in very different ways. Yeah. And that manifests itself in a very different way. And when you see the importance of something like a fatwa, what it can do, whether for good or bad, it's this power that you just can't really ignore. And so... I mean, I spent years teaching in environmental psychology and teaching kids with, I mean, I still do that sometimes with animals and gardens and being outside. And I don't know how much good that does compared to someone's local religious leader saying, don't do it. And here's why. That's the important part, right? Not just this yeah, dogmatic. I was going to say, I mean, a religious part. decree. Uh, you know, we in the West understand a fatwa as a sort of rather dogmatic thing. But you, mm. you say, I mean, in this case, it's talking about illegal traffic trafficking of wildlife, which mm. is obviously one, one wants to stop. But it was slightly mm. worrying, you know, when I read this article, I mean, it's a very <laughs> fascinating subject. Um, you're an environmentalist, we've established that, mm. and concerned with green issues. I must ask you, how do you think Germany's doing? A country that has a green mm. party and has a reasonable reputation, but what yeah, do you think? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I have to say I don't follow politics too closely, except for very... Well, I'm not talking about the politics. Right? I'm talking it's about generally, generally okay. the country. How generally, do you think... that's what the number one reason that brought me here. And mm -hmm. that makes me never want to leave. You know, I had a sign of the Grüne Grün party, party on my wall when I was like 11. To me, Germany's doing well in terms of it being so deep in the culture. I'm not even sure if Germans realize it, how deeply they have the sense of being connected to the land, the respect for the land, the res all these ancient agricultural traditions and heritage, and just the way that maybe a, a typical German makes a decision, you know, taking time to think things through a bit more, maybe than other cultures. Take it further, recycling. Yeah, you know... When I came yeah. here 20 <laughs> something years ago, the idea of putting bottles in banks was ingrained. It's perfectly normal, yeah. and now, hopefully, many more countries are doing it, but yeah. uh, it was a... To me, oh, that's a good idea. I'd never seen it. Right, and in one way, this is one individual action. People could say this is nothing, it's superficial. But to me, it's, it's more of a representation of what's deeper. You know, a German friend showed me an old 
German comedy show from the 80s the other day from Christmas, and there was a joke about the Christmas tree being environmentally friendly. And I was like, whoa, this was 1985 in Germany. That joke didn't happen in the US until 99. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were so, ahead. Um, well. Talking more about Germany, we, mm -hmm. we turn to the questionnaire. And I want to, uh, actually, this picture, you, you said you've invented your own categories, which I love, by the way. You've put the best way to integrate is join a posaune corps. We should explain <laughs> that. That's a trombone choir. choir. Mm -hmm. And I just put it together. I know it's not with this picture because there yeah. you are with your trombone, but this is in the, um, this is the Kanzler. This is the Kanzler. This is where Angela Merkel lives. Yeah, this is about my favorite picture of myself with my trombone. This was a glorious moment. So this was the first year, my trombone choir, which also has other instruments. We play for Angela Merkel's Christmas tree lighting every really? year. Every year? Mm -hmm. And some other functions, but the Christmas tree lighting is the big And why big event. a trombone choir? Why not <laughs> <laughs> a choir of trombones? You know, I just think it's hilarious because coming from the US where I'm from, I was maybe the only trombone or there's a few. And then I walk into this Posana Corps and it's Germans very excited about trombones. And there's 15 of us with our slides. And I don't, it's so, I mean, it's related to the Evangelische Church. So it's related to the church for sure. And they're just very earnest about it. It's yeah. a really, it's a special choir actually. Okay. Um, the best kept secret in Germany. Do you remember what you wrote? No. The Germans are funny, hilarious even. Germans are very funny people. Everybody should get to experience that. Yeah, no, that. it's good. <laughs> I wanted to hear that said because there is yeah. this cliche, isn't there, mm -hmm. that they don't have, of course they have a sense of humour. It's maybe different to yours or, or, or you know, but they are very funny people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm glad to see that. And your favourite <laughs> German word, there's a, you've got lots of them actually, Großartig, Beobachtig, Frühstücksflock and that. But what really interested me, it says... Uh, if it were for meaning, you said, I would have no idea to where to begin with my love of the German language. This, mm. Why do you love it so much? What really... Ooh, I, you can play with it. You know, it's this language you can really play with in terms of building words. There's something I find across all Germans, no matter where they come from, there's a certain way they, they use the language as well, um, in addition to the language itself, but... As with any language, there's something that's reflected from the culture and vice versa, mm. right? Mm. And so there's just something that's playful at the same time, regular um, and, yeah, predetermined, right, in terms of grammatic structure. And sure, maybe it's not romantic, you know, maybe it's not Italian, but I just love it. I love hearing it. I love playing with it. I love living in it. I love that the verb doesn't come until the end. Which really? Means <laughs> you know, yeah, we, yeah, the verb comes at the end, which can be... I love it. You know, you yeah. really have to pay attention. You have to really listen. To yeah, well, you actually said this brings me to another one where you say <laughs> the, a sure way to annoy a German is to interrupt them. And um, there's a certain truth in that, I think. But um, part of that, though, is that you can't interrupt them because you've got to wait for the verb. Yeah. Because you don't get the meaning of the sentence till the verb's there. So is that possibly why it, it, it annoys them if, yeah, if think, you interrupt them? I think that, and I think as well, you know, I've sat in a lot of German meetings. I teach in a school, usually here, a German school. And there's also just this idea, wherever I am with Germans, I have, there's this idea, you must hear everybody out first. This very long democratic process of hearing everybody out, where that same meeting in New York would have happened in 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, that has its pluses. Uh, yeah. uh, where did you learn your German? Did you learn it since you've been here? No, I took some classes in high school. I actually demanded them. So I learned a little bit then, and then I learned some more from a lovely professor at university, an undergrad. Mm. It was just a few of us in the class. And then once I came here, I hadn't spoken it in a long time, but I just decided I live here now forever, and I love the language. Oh, you live here now forever. Wow, <laughs> so there's a I statement. I better learn the there's language. There's a statement. <laughs> I want to take us back to Africa in a second because we've got a film. But, mm. but um, uh, just this picture. Mm. This is... Who's the, this? These, this is my Senegalese family. These are my girls. Um, yeah, now there's six of them. Uh, there's two that are, are sisters that are really my closest family, but these are their cousins and everybody's at the house all day. 
You're sort of godmother. This isn't. You, you, yeah, I mean, they yeah. actually call me the Wolof word for um, because the one girl actually has my name as her middle name, um, but they call me mom. They call me their second mom. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go back to Africa now, and my guest's own video diary of her second home, which, as she said, is in. Senegal on the coast. And Catherine, perhaps you can talk us through these pictures that we're going sure, to see. Sure, sure. Okay, so this is the village round point where the buses and taxis come. Um, that actually has a paved road. It's, I call it my village, but it's inside of the capital, but it's a bit secluded on the coast. It's, an, it's a, fisher, a fishing village. This is the market. So this is me buying bisap, which is hibiscus. Um, they have a lot of local medicinal plants that they drink and they eat and they work. Uh, so there's one for stopping diarrhea and things like this. Uh, and they definitely work better than any medication usually. So this market is right in my village. And how did you learn about all the sort of things like hibiscus and things like that? Did you just, it's learning by doing. It's learning by doing and I, I learn a little bit more every year. I have to say I intentionally don't read a lot. I, I would rather go out and explore. I quickly found out the word for peanut butter uh, because that's their big crop there, but you can't buy it in the store as we know it. So. Where are we going now? Oh, this is my house where I usually live. I move around a lot um, in the village, but this is where my Senegalese family lives. So I'm usually trying to stay in a room in this house. So this is just a little one-room studio, and that's all my Sahel calling stuff that I drag back and forth wherever I live. That's my floor desk that looks just like my floor desk in Berlin. And... Ah. Yeah. Dancing. This is what happens when all the girls are at home alone and the chores are done. <laughs> uh, this is how people pass their time, you know? Yeah. Do you mind me asking, where are, where are their mom and dad? I mean, they're around, aren't they? Yeah, so the sad answer yeah. to where is their dad is the answer to lots of families there. Their dad is somewhere in Europe, illegally trying to make money. Oh, and okay. the moms are out all day trying to sell food on oh, the street. Oh, and we must, they're, they're, this statue. Oh, this statue is a catastrophe. The statue was something like billions of dollars. It's an oh, African Renaissance you monument. I see you there shouting at it, actually. But yeah, the, this statue, I, you told me before, it cost how many? It was billions. I'm pretty sure it was billions of dollars. No, not of dollars. billions of dollars. No, come on, that's thousands of millions. I heard it cost $27 million to build, or was it? I don't, I don't know. I've got it. In any case, but it's a disaster. No. <laughs> but it, and it's it's money that obviously you believe could have been used better elsewhere, to say yeah. the least. It's this, you know, total representation of priorities that I think are not in the right place. And the one good thing about the statue is everybody agrees it's terrible. So from taxi men to village people to your hipster in Dakar, everybody can sort of laugh and, yeah, complain about it together. Mm. It kind of brings me on to the question uh, one hears a lot more about now is, and, and I would like your opinion on it, 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 it's not money that Africa wants because it all goes in the wrong mm. place. It's actually um, practical help. Would, would you agree with that or do you think it's a bit of both or what? Um, or what? It's probably a bit of both. I think, you know, I struggle with this on a daily basis, whether I'm there or here. You know, how do I help? Who do I help? Is helping even okay? Where did the problems come from? Um, and in this case, I actually sort of look at it the same way Obama had talked about the African-American population. It's the same way I think about Africa. To a certain degree, the problems there are the fault of Europe or the US. To a certain degree, it's on Africans themselves. And so it does have to be a mix of figuring out what needs to happen and then how to support Africans in doing it themselves. So any type of, you know, you can't go in and build a hospital and then leave because people don't know how to mm, yeah, help yeah. the hospital. You yeah, know, or... sure. But you alternate between mm -hmm. the two. How, how do you do that? Uh, they're two very different mm. existences. Here you are in a very Western, you know, modern, modern city, um, rush it with a, a, a very fast city, if you like, like mm. cities are. And presumably life is much slower and, uh, in Senegal um, mm. and very different. How do you adjust to them both? Yeah, I mean, Dakar, the capital of Senegal, is moving a lot and it's growing fast, but I do live a quiet sort of village life. I would say that 
you know, they keep me balanced. The two places keep me balanced. And I would say Senegal is poor, maybe in money, but is rich in so many things that Germany is not, or that an average first world developed country in terms of people taking time for each other, the importance of family, of community structure. Mm -hmm. So it's rich in these other ways that keep me grounded. You know, it's everything is possible there. And then you come to Germany and there's tons of money, but yeah. I get told no all day long. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. but you want we see you. You give me the impression you. Mm. This is where you want to be. This, you want to be. Mm. Uh, give up your American passport. Mm -hmm. You want to be a, a German citizen. Mm -hmm. a, so, the advantages here are greater than anywhere else. This is the, yeah. the where you'd like to call your high mat, as we sometimes yeah. use in the program. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like Germany offers the most balanced lifestyle. On a daily basis, on a looking forward basis, I feel like it's a very balanced way of living. Mm. Well, with that, I think we <laughs> finish the program. Just very briefly, if because I've been fascinated <laughs> the whole program. Will you show us your shoes? Sure. Where should shoes? I put Can them? Can we get here? a camera on these shoes? These are amazing <laughs> shoes. We'll talk about them perhaps after the show. But a quick, a quick look at the shoes to to, to finish the program. What a way! I bet you a program's never been finished like that. <laughs> <laughs> and a pair of shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, good luck with all your projects. It's been fascinating talking thanks. to you, Catherine Vance. Thanks very Vance, I should yeah, say. Should I thanks very much. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Don't forget to write to us at insights at dw.de. And I just mentioned sahelcalling.com as well, because it's a very good cause. Thanks to Catherine, thanks to you. Join us again at the same time next week, if you can. Bye for now.